بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد النبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is my pleasure to be with you tonight and uh, my deepest appreciation for the organizers of this event, the brothers in FAMSI and the <coughs> Lebanese organization. And uh, for all of you in this beautiful masjid, mashallah, I did not expect to see this large uh, of a masjid in Australia. Uh, this is my uh, fourth day in Australia. I was in Mo Melbourne, and uh, this is my first uh, day in Sydney, and this is my first visit to Australia. And alhamdulillah, I, I am uh, very impressed with the Islamic activities and the number of Muslims that are committed to Islam that we see, uh, mashallah, uh, an example of tonight. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in a very great hadith, Wallahi, la taqoom al-sa'ah hatta yablugha hadha al-deen ma balagha al-layl wa al-nahar. The Prophet Sallallahu says, I swear by Allah, the day of judgment shall not come until this deen reaches as far as day and night. From Mecca, you are the furthest. This is the, as far as the day and night can go. I also visited uh, several times after my graduation from the United States. And uh, this is the other side from Mecca. And no further, even Hawaii has some Muslims. وصدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Tonight, I would like to share with you some thoughts about the future of this deen, the future of Islam. Especially with the pressures that we see upon Islam and the events of September 11 and what Muslims have faced everywhere, including in this continent, after that event, where are, where are we going from here? What is the future of this deen? To start with, I did a full research on history. I, uh, besides my PhD in petroleum engineering and my minor in management, one of the things that I love besides Sharia is history. So I did a full study on history. And I found that there is a trend in history. There is a continuous trend that repeats itself time after time. And let me share with you some of the thoughts on this issue. Civilizations go through a certain path. They start weak, and they start to grow gradually, gradually. It takes years, usually hundreds of years, until they become uh, at their peak, at the top. An example of that is the Persian civilization before Islam started weak, gradually grew until it peaked 2,000 years after that. The Byzantines, the Romans, took about 1,200 years of gradual growth until they peaked. And you see this in many, many civilizations. But what many people do not recognize is that when civilizations collapse, 
they collapse so quickly. And let me give some examples. Let's take the Persians. We said 2,000 years of growth until they reached the top of the world. They were the highest in civilization, competing only with the Romans. The lands that they controlled was so huge, extending from India to Turkey to Iraq, part of the Arab world, part of the Arab Peninsula were their allies, and their capital was Al Madain in Al Iraq. Huge. Military speaking, the most powerful army in the world. In each battle that they face, the Muslims, their armies are usually 250, 300, 350,000. And we're talking 1,400 years ago. 1,400 years ago. These numbers are huge today. How many armies in the world today have these numbers? And this is not the whole army. This is only a sector of their army, part of their army. That's how huge they were. Very strong civilization. Military equipment, they had the best fighters and the best equipment in the world. They used the technology that was not only Persian, but also Roman and Indian, all available for them. If you want to talk about science, philosophy, art, whatever, they were the highest, competing only with the Romans. So they were not a weak country when the Muslims started to attack them. They were not divided. They were united under one king. Huge empire, the Persian Empire. Very strong, the highest in the world, united, excelled in every area of life. Superpower. How long did, did, that, did that empire take until it collapsed? The first attack on the Persian Empire by the Muslims was at the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu in the year 12 of Hijrah, he sent two armies. One led by Khalid ibn al-Walid al-Makhzumi radiallahu anhu attacking southern Iraq and the other army was led by Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha al-Shaybani radiallahu anhu who was attacking from northern Iraq. The attack of both armies started on the year 12 of Hijrah. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu swept through southern Iraq in the direction of the capital, Al-Mada'in. Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha could not move. He was faced with a very strong resistance. And he did not have the military abilities of Khalid. So he was stopped. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu continued moving north Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha was stationed, could not move south. He was faced with a huge resistance. During that move, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu needed Khalid ibn al-Walid in Palestine. So he asked him to leave Al-Iraq and move to Palestine. And I will tell you the story there. And he appointed another leader to continue the attack. This one is Khal al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khal, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu. So he continued the attack. 
and then united the two armies under his leadership and they faced the Persians in the great battle of Al Qadisiya. <coughs> Al Qadisiya, one of the greatest battles of Islam in the year 15th of Hijrah, broke the back of the Persians. Three years it took for the empire to collapse. An empire that was built in more than 2,000 years collapsed in less than three years. Why? How could this happen? They were not weak. They had the best technology, best armies. They are politically strong, united. Art, science, etc. was the highest philosophy, logic, whatever. Poetry, one of the greatest civilizations. What caused that civilization to collapse? Before I answer, let us take another civilization. The other civilization is the Roman civilization, led by Caesar. It was the second superpower of the world, militarily speaking. But they were competing with the first strongly. And they had three capitals. Constantinople, which is Istanbul, for the north. Jerusalem, Al-Quds, for the east and Alexandria, al Iskandaria, for Northern Africa. And they controlled all North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey, and the surrounding. Huge, all under one leader, Caesar. He usually stays in Istanbul, but sometimes moves to govern from Jerusalem. When the Prophet ﷺ sent his message to Caesar, he was in his capital, Jerusalem. Anyway, strong civilization again, huge armies. In their battle, Al Yarmouk, the army of the Romans was 340,000 men. And that is only one of their armies. Just imagine how strong that civilization was. We all know about the, their philosophy and poetry and uh, civ uh, logic and civil it's a huge civilization, one of the best in the world. Strong military, strong politically, etc., etc., etc. The first attack of the Muslims on the Roman Empire was also at the year 12 of Hijrah at the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He sent four armies moving in the area. Amr ibn al-As to Palestine and Jordan. Ziyad ibn Abi to Syria, Sharahbil ibn Hassanah to Palestine and Lebanon, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan to the northern Palestine and the rest of Syria. Uh, Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn Jarrah. So these four are the leaders of these four armies. So they started to move. Caesar, when he heard that the armies are coming, he immediately left Jerusalem to Damascus. When the armies approached even more, he left Damascus to Istanbul. And he was aware of this new power. He knew that this... By the way, all the four armies, the number of men in the four armies 
was 34,000. While the, one of the Roman armies was 340. But Caesar was very clever. When he left Syria, he said, goodbye Syria forever. He knew. So they moved and they started to conquer the area, Palestine and the surrounding. Caesar decided to send his strongest army. So he sent 340,000. Now each of these Muslim armies was 8,000, 10,000. So Abu Ubaidah anhu called upon the four armies to collect together. And they gathered and they stayed as four armies, but in one area. Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, when he heard about the huge army coming, he knew that this was a huge danger. Muslims have never faced an army this size before. So he immediately sent for Khalid ibn al-Walid to leave Iraq and move to Palestine. Khalid ibn Walid, in a miraculous trip, reached Palestine in the area of Al Yarmouk. And there he found the four armies separated, with each has its own leader. He said, You cannot fight this way. You must be united under one leadership. But because he was afraid that they might fight over who would be the leader of this great battle, like Muslims fight all over. They want to be leaders, they want to be imams, they want to be presidents of organizations, etc. Unfortunately. So he took that into account and he said, let us unite and each day one of us will be the leader. So they said, yes. So they united the four armies and they chose Khalid ibn Walid to be the first day leader. But after the first day, they decided to let him continue because nobody can lead an army like Khalid. The battle was on the year 14th of Hijra. Only two, two years. And they broke the back of the Roman Empire in the East. The rest was so easy, clean up work. No real battle after that. It's all Ajnadin, whatever, it's, it's a clean up work. But Al Yarmouk, a civilization that strong would collapse in two years? How could this happen? After the clean up work, Of course, during the battle, by the way, during the battle of Al Yarmouk, the news came that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu died. And Umar ibn al-Khattab became the Khalifa. So Umar ibn al-Khattab from al Madina was directing the armies in Persia and the armies in the Roman Empire. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu sent a suggestion to Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, let me conquer Egypt. Umar was hesitant. He said, move your army into the direction of Egypt and I will send you a letter telling you what to do. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu was one of the most clever men Muslims have ever seen. He moved into the direction of Egypt. This was the 18th year of Hijrah. A messenger, before he entered Egypt, a messenger came from Umar ibn al-Khattab with a message. Amr ibn al-As refused to receive the message. He said, wait, I will 
take the message later on. He said, this is a message from the Khalifa. He said, I know, wait. I will meet with you later. And he kept moving. And the messenger wanted to meet with him and he was refused. Until Amr ibn al-As crossed the border of Egypt. Then he said, let the messenger see me. He took the message from the messenger and the message from the Khalifa Umar ibn al-Khattab said to Amr ibn al-As, if you have crossed the border of Egypt, continue. <laughs> if you have not, come back. <laughs> See, very clever. So Amr ibn al-As sent to him, we have crossed, <laughs> we are ready to conquer Egypt. But I have only 4,000 men with me. Only 4,000. The number of fighting men, according to statistics of that time. How do we know the statistics of that time? Those non-Muslims would pay jizya. Instead of zakat, they would pay jizya. Only fighting men. Women don't pay it. Old men and children don't pay it. Only fighting men. Amr ibn al-Khattab later on sends to Amr ibn al-As. He said, count for me how many pay jizya. This is in the seerah. Am Amr ibn al-As sends him back that the number of men, fighting men, paying jizya is alf alf. Million. One million. He was attacking one million with only 4,000. So he sent a letter to Omar. He said, I have only 4,000. Send me some more fighting men. So he sent him. He did not have enough armies. I mean, the Muslims were very few. The armies were already in Syria and Palestine and uh, they were conquered. The armies were already reaching India. They were covering all of this. And the total number of the Muslim army that is conquering this whole area, the total number was about 60,000 in all lands. So where can I find men for you? So he started to collect the Bedouins and whatever did not go for jihad, go to Egypt. So he sent to him, I have sent you a supply of 8,000 men. Amr ibn al-As counted the Muslims that came from Medina and there were only 4,000. So he sent him a letter back. He said, where is the rest? You said 8,000. He said, among the 4,000 are four men. Each counts as a thousand. Muhammad ibn Maslama, Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Ubad ibn al-Samit, wal muqdad ibn al-Aswad. Radiyallahu anhu. Do we see now men that count for a thousand? <laughs> Most men today don't add up to one. Each was counted as a thousand. Now, the whole army was 8,000 facing Egypt with its huge civilization. Add to that the Roman army with the Roman fleet of ships in Alexandria with direct contact with Istanbul. Strong in military, strong in civilization, strong in everything. He was not facing weak people. Egypt was one of the strongest nations on earth and governed by the Romans. How long did it take Amr ibn al-As to conquer Egypt 
and enter Alexandria, its capital, for not years, four months. Only four months. What is this? What happens to these civilizations, these superpowers that they think they have the world order in hand? They control the world. They can attack anyone anywhere. What happened to them? They collapse so quickly. Why? Some of you might say this is the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, the true religion. No, that's not only that. Let's take another situation. Let's talk years after that. The first attack on the Spanish Empire by the Muslims was in the year 92 of Hijrah. No companions. Led by a non-Arab. Led by Tariq ibn Ziyad, who was not an Arab. And he was not definitely a companion. 92 was the first attack. 95, they finished Spain and Portugal. And they were already attacking France. One year later, Muslims were only 60 kilometers from Paris. What happened to this civilization? Three years it collapsed. What happened to the French? They could not stop the Muslims. They almost reached their capital. What happened? We're, to we're not talking hundreds of years or tens, brothers and sisters. We're talking two years here, three years here, three years here, one year here. What's this? There is a secret. There's something common that is going on in all of these civilizations. All of these civilizations collapsed because of two things, not one, two, always two things. The first one was moral destruction within. They had no morals. They were corrupt from inside. They were corrupt morally, materialistic world, sexual relations, family structure destructed, individualism. This is very similar to what we see in the Western civilization today. But that is, by itself, it was not enough to make them collapse. Because they were corrupt for years and years. That by itself is not enough to collapse a civilization. There must be another reason. And the other reason is a better civilization or a stronger civilization attacking them, challenging them. Either they are better or they are stronger, materialistically speaking. Either better morally or stronger materialistically. And that's why we saw the Mongolians conquering Europe. They were not better morally. The Mongolians were also bad but they were stronger militarily. And we see this trend all over again. Don't be fooled by the power of the unbelievers on earth. Short living does not last. Mata'un qaleel. Now, understanding this on one hand, let us understand the Islamic civilization. See, every civilization 
in the world went through this trend, gradual growth, it peaks, challenged by an outside power, collapses very quickly. This is repeated in history. Except Islam, that is the only civilization that did not go through this. And let me show you quickly the movement of the Islamic civilization. Of course, this would need a very long lesson, but I will summarize it in short words. Islam started in Mecca. From a civilization point of view, civilization starts when you have a country to rule. Without a country, without land that you rule, you don't have really a full civilization. You might have a theory, a methodology, an ideology, but not a full civilization until you establish it on land. So the first 13 years of Islam in Mecca were the development of the ideology, the faith, the morals for the Muslims. And that is why you see in the first 13 years of Islam, there was no political system, social system, judiciary system. There was nothing. Even in worship, that was, there was only salah, prayers. Yeah, Siyam, Zakat, Hajj, all came in Medina. It was an establishment of the ideology and the morals. Imanun wa akhlaq. That was Mecca. So, with Hijra, the Islamic civilization started. And Rahimallahu Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wa man ma'ah for the right choice of Hijra as the start of the Islamic calendar. Because it was the start of civilization for Islam. Also, it was the start of a state. Everything changed after that. Brothers and sisters, even the Quran changed. When you read Surah Makkiyah, the style is different from the Surah Madaniyah. Even the Quran changed with this move from Mecca to Medina. So that was the year zero. That's where we started. How large was the Islamic State? Oh, definitely smaller than Sydney. <laughs> One very small town called Yathrib, later on named Al Madina Al Munawwara, Allah Sakiniha Afdal Salat wa Taslim. Very small. We're not talking hundreds of thousands, maximum estimation was about 30,000. A very small town. And that is counting the non-Muslims and counting the Jews, etc. Et <laughs> That's all they had. And women and children, and I'm counting everyone. So, quickly moving through history. Year two of Hijra, the battle of Badr. Just a small note on the Battle of Badr. I explained it in detail in my series, album uh, as Sira Nabawiyah. But I will take only one comment. See, the Muslims in Badr were 314. The unbelievers were 950. Between 950. 950. The number of horses with the kuffar was 200. Number of horses with the Muslims were only two. 
So we're not talking we were larger in numbers, larger in powers, etc. It's very small. And the whole battle is a very small battle. You're talking 300 or so people meeting 950 people. What is this? According to any scale in the world, in the past or the present, this is a very small battle. Do you know, brothers and sisters, how long did the battle last? Two hours. Not two days. Not two days. Two hours. One of the kuffar, who was not in the battle, who was not from Quraysh, was sitting on a hill when the battle happened. He started to watch, like a movie happening in front of him. <laughs> so he was watching. He, he was not with the Muslims, he was not with Quraysh, he was just watching. His name was Ibn Asham. Suddenly, two hours later, the battle was over. And he was expecting, you know, a, a long movie, like an Indian movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very short documentary. So he said to himself, Wallahi ma ra'aytu kal yawmi ajaba. I have never seen a surprise like this in my life. They ran away like women. Five years later, this man was visiting Medina. He was still not a Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ saw him. He asked him, Are you Ibn Asham? He said, Yes. He said, didn't you watch the battle of Badr? He said, yes. He said, what did you say after the battle was over? He said, nothing. He said, didn't you say to yourself, Wallahi ma ra'aytuka al-yawmi ajaba, farru minhu kan nisa? <laughs> I have never seen a surprise like this. They ran up from him like women. Ibn Asham said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله والله ما حدثت بها أحدا. He said the shahadatain and said, I have never spoken this to anyone. It's the prophethood. Seventy unbelievers were killed and seventy were wounded. What is the seventy? That's all. I mean in in bombs today, you see more people killed. 70 people. And this battle is the greatest battle of Islam. Why? Why is it the greatest battle of Islam? A small battle in numbers, very short in time, limited in place, did not conquer Mecca. Still it is the great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يوم الفرقان يوم التقى الجمعان It's the division It's the battle that divided truth from evil We understand it by a comment of one young man in Medina He was with the army, one of the Ansar He was with the army When they came back victorious his family was congratulating him on winning in the battle. He said one sentence that the Prophet ﷺ heard. He said, Why are you congratulating us? We've met some old, bold men. <laughs> We slaughtered them like sheep. It was that simple. It was not a struggle and a, you know, and, and a, a battle that was hard. It was so easy. The Prophet ﷺ heard that and he corrected him. He said, لا تقل هذا يا ابن أخي Don't say this, oh my nephew. 
أولئك الملأ We killed the leaders Only two of the leaders of Quraysh were saved Only two Abu Sufyan who was taking the caravan and Abu Lahab the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who did not attend the battle when the news came to Abu Lahab he was so angry and so sad he died three days later so only Abu Sufyan was left can you imagine a country suddenly loses all of its government every member of the parliament in one shot that's what happened in Badr so Badr started to change the scale Quraysh understood that this is a huge danger on them so they gathered their army and uh, some support from other Arabs and they moved to the battle of Uhud and Muslims were defeated in Uhud and that was in the year 3 of Hijrah so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tell them it is not strength it is obedience when you disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Uhud you lost when you took the straight path you did not lose I'll move short, uh, quicker on the fifth year of Hijrah, Quraysh was able to collect a stronger army and the Jews helped. And Ghatafan and many other Arab tribes and the army of Al-Ahzab, the allies, came to attack Medina. 10,000 strong 10,000 for the Arabs at that time was a strong army the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was faced with a very huge danger they digged the ditch around Medina to protect it and that is why it's called the battle of the allies Al-Ahzab or the battle of the ditch Al-Khandaq For one month, they continued their attack on the Muslims. Medina was protected from the east and the west by huge stony, uh, stony places where armies cannot move. From the southwest, it was protected by a mountain. From the north, it was protected by the ditch. From the southeast, the Prophet ﷺ had an agreement with the Jews of Bani Quraidah that they will protect this side of Medina. The Jews, during the battle, they did not keep their promise as usual. And they agreed with the Kuffar that they will help them and attack the Muslims from the south. Now, the Muslims were barely able to stop a 10,000 strong army from the north. Now they have to face another army that can attack their own women and children inside Medina. And there was no protection there. That's how great the danger was. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ When they came to you from the top and from the bottom وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ You were so scared. See, some Muslims today are so scared so scared at that moment Muslims were so scared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that that their hearts reached their throats 
It's an example of being so, so afraid. هُنَالِكَ ابْتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا It was the test. Who would be so scared to run away from the masjid and Islamic work and the organizations? I'm afraid of terrorist laws, whatever. So scared. They might get me. You know how many were so scared that they left the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was left with only 300 men. Everyone ran away. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Almighty interfered with the angels and the wind and made them so made the enemy so afraid that they ran away. And then the Prophet Sallallahu met the Jews in the battle of Bani Quraidah and slaughtered 700 of the traitors. Which was the last presence of the Jews in Medina. And they moved to Khaybar. So, that was the year of five of Hijrah. Now look, is that a strong civilization? No. How about science and math? Nothing. How about buildings? No, nothing. How about the masjid? The masjid was so simple, it had no carpet. And it had no ceiling. Only some palm leaves put on top. Whenever it rains, the Prophet ﷺ himself would make sujood in mud. Is that a great civilization? From the materialistic point of view? No. Nothing. Is that a strong army? No. How about equipment? Nothing. What did this civilization have? that made it conquer the world. Think, brothers and sisters, think. Let's continue. We will come to that. The Prophet ﷺ, in the year 7th of Hijrah, heard about the Jews getting another allies army together in Khaybar. So he decided not to wait. And he attacked them in Khaybar and conquered Khaybar. And that was the end of the Jews in the Arab Peninsula. They were traitors, conspirers against the Prophet continuously. Never forget that. In Khaybar, after the battle, one of the Jewish women brought some food to the Prophet ﷺ because he forgave her family and did not he, he forgave everyone in Khaybar he did not kill them those who surrendered not like what they do to us so the Prophet ﷺ was so peaceful so she came thanking him with some sheep meat full of poison The Prophet ﷺ and the companions started to eat. One companion, his name is Bishr, ate and died. The Prophet ﷺ ate from it, stopped, did not continue. And he said to everyone, stop, don't eat. This sheep, this cooked sheep is telling me that it is poisoned. But Bishr has already ate from the sheep and died. The Prophet ﷺ says, مَا زِلْتُ أَجِدُ مِنْ أَكْلَةِ الشَّاتِ فِي خَيْبَرْ حَتَّى قَطَعَتِ الْأَبْهَرَ مِنِّي I continued for the rest of my life to feel the pain of the poison of Khaybar until it cut my veins 
Al-Imam ibn al-Qayyim says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died because of that. Because of the vein. He mentions, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, حَتَّى قَطَعَتِ الْأَبْهَرَ الْأَبْهَرَ هُوَ عِرْقُ الْقَلْبِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, this poison caused the vein of my heart to stop. Al-Imam ibn al-Qayyim says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died as a shaheed because he was poisoned in a battle. Yes, it took a few years later, but it is from that cause. It is the agreement of all scholars that if somebody is wounded in a battle and dies because of the wound, 10 years later even, he's still a shaheed. Ibn al-Qayyim says to the Muslims, remember who killed your prophet. Never forget who killed your prophet. Anyway, so that was Khaybar, the seventh year of Hijrah. So many events detailed in Asir and Nabawiyah. On the eighth year of Hijrah, Muslims were able to conquer Mecca. In the great battle of Fath Makkah. Immediately after that, Hawazin, one of the strongest tribes, even stronger than Quraysh, decided to go into a battle with the Prophet, not to wait for him to attack a Ta'if. Immediately, two months after Makkah, was the battle of At-Ta'if. And the, uh, the battle of Hunayn with the people of At-Ta'if. And in the beginning of the battle, Muslims were defeated. وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنِ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ فَلَمْ تُغْنِ عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا At the battle of Hunayn, for the first time, Muslims were greater in number than their enemies. Muslims were 12,000, their enemies were 10. And they were defeated because they felt, we defeated the Kuffar when we were few. Now we are more, of course we will defeat them. You don't defeat them because you are more and your army is stronger. You don't defeat them because of that. You defeat them because you are the army of Allah. You have faith and obedience. Only 100 men were left with the Prophet ﷺ. Only 100. And he continued to fight against the 10,000 of, of Hawazin. The news came to those who ran away that the Prophet is still fighting, he did not run away, so they started to come back. None of them reached Hunayn before the Muslims' army of 100 defeated the Kuffar army of 10,000. Fil Hadith. This is a hadith. Wallahi ma wasala minna ahad illa wal muslimuna yajma'oon al ghanaim. This is the hadith. None of us arrived at the battleground until we saw the Muslims were collecting the spoils of war. Remember, remember what is our balance. The year 9th of Hijrah. The Arabs came to Medina declaring their Islam. The year 10th of Hijrah, the Battle of Tabuk. For the first time now, the Muslim army led by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is attacking the Roman Empire. It is not an, a message for the Arabs. 
It is a message for the world. Caesar heard about the army and he heard that it is led by the prophet. Caesar was a priest and a man who knows the holy books. He gathered his parliament and said, would you listen to my advice? They say, you are our leader and our priest and the most knowledgeable among us. What is your advice? He said, let us follow Islam because it will conquer the world. This man is the prophet that is mentioned in the books. And they said, no, we will not leave our religion. He said, if not so, then listen to my second advice. They said, yes, what is it? He said, don't face him in a battle. He will slaughter you, no matter how large your army is. They said, with this we will listen. So the Roman army refused to meet the Muslim army. The Muslim army stayed in Tabuk for one month, waiting for the Roman army to come. They did not. So, from the year five, where we were so little, only in Medina, only 300, that's how large Islam was. I told you there was no civilization, no great buildings, etc. To the year 10, only five years, Muslims already have conquered Arabia and already are attacking the Romans who refuse to face them. Is that a gradual move or is that peaking so quickly? Look and think. And then in the beginning of the 11th year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ died. And the Arabs turned away from Islam. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu insisted that he will fight them. Abu Umar ibn al-Khattab, the strong man, was, resist, was hesitant. He said, oh, how could you face all of Arabia? Only three cities were left as Muslims. Medina, Mecca, and the Ta'if. Mecca was thinking of turning away from Islam. At Ta'if was the last city to accept Islam in Arabia. So really they could not depend on anyone except Medina. That's all is left from Islam. Back to Medina. Abu Bakr Siddiq said, I will fight them. Even if I'm alone, I will fight them. And he started to call any Muslim. There were many Muslims who still are Muslims, but as individuals all around Arabia. See, he called them to Medina. The moment he gathers a few hundred men, he will send them to fight one of the tribes. Twelve armies were formed in few months. Twelve. But don't think about twelve large armies. The number of fighting men in all the armies, the total number of all the armies was 10,000 men. So some armies had less than a thousand and they were facing all of Arabia. Some of the armies they faced were, were so huge. Khalid ibn al-Walid was leading the battle of Yamama. The Muslims in Yamama were 3,000. Abu uh, Musaylim al-Kadhab had 100,000. And in less than one year, Arabia was back to Islam. 
When did this happen in history? Has this ever happened that a civilization would collapse and within one year it would come back? Did this ever happen in history? Brothers and sisters, we're talking about something unique, something different. This is Islam. This is not a regular deen or a regular army or a regular civilization. This is Islam. And not only that, the next year, the 12th year of Hijrah, I told you, they started to attack the largest nations on earth. <laughs> it's like a small city like Medina, within two years, attacks Moscow and Washington. <laughs> This is the scale of what we're talking about. This is history, proven history, this is known. So, moving quickly. 12th year of Hijrah was the attack. 14th was the collapse of the Persians. 15th was the collapse of the Romans. By the year 92, Muslims were already in Spain. 95 already in France. Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, had a plan. Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi was one of those who attacked France. Had a plan. A very strange plan. Very few people know about it. I've described this all in my other series, Tariq al Andalus, the history of Al Andalus. See, Muslims were able to spread east, and they were able to spread west. When they moved north, they were stopped by Istanbul. 600 years they could not conquer it. So the Muslims were stopped north. They could not conquer Europe because of Constantinople. So Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi said, I will attack Istanbul from the west. I will conquer Europe from the west and attack Europe from the west, from Spain, France, and so on, until he was stopped by the Umayyad Khalif, because he was going to go through the whole of Europe, which had an army not less than seven million, and his army was about 2,400. And he was going for it. <laughs> but the Khalifa stopped him. He said, no, this is too dangerous. Wallahi, I don't know if he, يعني, if he would have let him go. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, but within less than 100 years, who had the largest area as a nation? The Muslims. Who had the largest army? The Muslims. Who was leading science and math and astronomy and every area of life, philosophy, logic, whatever, poetry, etc., etc., etc. Who was doing that? The Muslims. Who had the best of civilization? The Muslims. See, remember when we talked about the Romans, the Persians, the Spanish, etc. It took hundreds of years until they peaked. The Muslims took less than 100. Of course, if I had longer time, I would have gone into more details to you, but time is short. So let me go quickly 